Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eyal. This is the Enterprise Virtual User Group, Enterprise AI Virtual User Group. And uh, we are joined today by several other uh, user groups that um, join us due to the interest of this uh, subject that really probably concerns pretty much everybody, not just people in the AI or software development or even high tech. Um, so we have a um, Dave Snowden, Snowden, uh, who uh, who deals a lot with the physical robots, but also with the software robots, chatbots, and uh, he has a lot of experience now with the chat uh, GPT, and uh, has a lot to say. So uh, we are very interested to hear this presentation. Yeah, so um, I'm quite excited about this topic. Um, I have been hearing about it and and bookmarking articles from Medium to read about what it's made of and the architecture, but Dave has already made the job easier for me. He's done all the research and he's going to present it to us. And uh, I might not need to read all those articles and try to understand the difficult architectures involved behind ChatGPT. I have signed up to a bunch of uh, ChatGPT wait lists. So I have been approved on the main one. I'm waiting for the ChatGPT 4 API access. Uh, I've also logged, I think I have signed up for the plugin. So there's a chat GPT plugins. Um, I haven't signed up for the Slack app because it needs you to be an owner of an organization. Uh, so I'm, and, and I have just discovered recently, there's something called e um, model evaluation repository. I can share that later on. So Jet, uh, the open AI people have been uh, publishing their models and they want us to test it out and give them feedback. I did not know there was a repository on that. And so it's on GitHub. I can share those links, but I think Dave has probably got a lot more stuff on ChatGPT than I have. But I will share some of those uh, lists so people can sign up and join and wait for the API access keys and ChatGPT plugin access because they want feedback from developers. So I'm assuming there's a lot of developers joining us. Uh, and you know you can join the galore, the ChatGPT galore. Uh, over to you, Dave. Ah, right, thanks, man, Manny, and thanks, Ayol. Um, okay, let's, let's get started. Um, just share my screen. I think it's screen two. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so yeah, yeah. Again, thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I guess this may come across as deliciously retro, or me being a luddite. Uh, but I guess the first thing to say is this, this presentation was not written by AI. I, I did not use ChatGPT to write the presentation. And uh, as tempting and, and as meta as it would have been to use it, uh, one of the motivations of me giving uh, talks like this is to test my own understanding. So it would be a bit counterproductive if I used uh, ChatGPT to talk about ChatGPT, because then I, I wouldn't be sure I'm understanding it myself. So yeah, hence the, the not written by AI banner. And, so what am I going to cover then? Uh, first, uh, a little bit about me, so you know where I'm coming from. Um, then we're going to start with a, uh, with a, a sort of pre-recorded demo, because I think it's good to see what ChatGPT can actually do. And I guess probably many of you have already used it and already have ideas. Maybe some of you haven't. So I thought it'd be good to start with actually seeing what it can, what, what it can do and where it works and perhaps where it doesn't. And then the bulk of this talk will be looking at how it works and I'm going to take a fairly high level here, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to assume very much AI knowledge. Um, but I'm going to go fairly quick, because so hopefully, even if you know a reasonable amount about neural networks, there's, there's something in here for you. And then finally, I'm going to end with a, um, a couple of thoughts, which, which are not really meant to be a definitive view on the topic about what it means, but uh, 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 more sort of prompts for discussion. Uh, as AL said, there'll be time at the end to break up into um, uh, tables and have a discussion. So I thought maybe th the right way to end this would be to have some things that maybe you might want to talk about later. Okay, um, so me, uh, I'm currently a, a senior software engineer at G Research. Uh, I'm based in London, UK, and people have been paying me to do stuff for co with computers for about 32 years now. So I, I'm getting a bit long in the tooth, I, I, as you can probably tell from the amount of gray hair in, in my, my video feed. Um, I mentioned that I was uh, 
somewhat robot obsessed, and, and that is entirely true. Um, as you can see from my profile picture, I uh, do have a, a now robot, and he'll be making an appearance later. And I am not the only human in my household, and there are still more robots than humans. Uh, so make of that what you will, um, but that, that's kind of me. So um, I'd like to start with a quote from a machine learning expert uh, called Cassie Korsikoff. And I, I apologize, I've certainly murdered her name there. Um, but she's, she's an expert at Google and she writes extensively on machine learning. And this is what she said in one of her articles about ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT is a bullshitter. The essence of bullshit is unconcerned with truth. It's not a liar, because to be a liar, you must know the truth and intend to mislead. ChatGPT is indifferent to the truth. And I think that's something that's really worth bearing in mind as you use it yourself, because you know, ChatGPT will bullshit with confidence. It'll tell you things that are absolutely not true, but it won't admit to any uncertainty. So it's totally you know, buyer beware. It's on you to verify that what it's telling you actually makes sense. And uh, I've got a couple of examples where you can see that it's, it's coming slightly off the rails. Um, so let's have a quick demo then. Let's see what ChatGPT can actually do. What is all the fuss about? And this first example isn't from me. Um, it's a guy called uh, Ivan, and he blogs about Java programming. And he has this excellent blog post. Uh, you can see the link and the, the QR code on the, on the screen. And he has this excellent blog post where he talks about, well, how can you um, write Java code using ChatGPT? And uh, you can see here, he's got a very simple function. Yeah, it's a very simple function that um, calculates and returns the sum of an array of integers. Now, the interesting thing about this blog post is that he shows how it's the iterative nature, like the first function doesn't have any error checks. So he said, okay, well, could you please add some error checks? Um, maybe you can use a more recent version of Java. Could you use um, um, Java 8? And what I think it brings home to me, if you, if you read the full article, is that ChatGPT is generating useful code that works, but to get to the point where you have code that you know, people would say is good, that has error checking, it takes some iterations and it has to be told, okay, what you've done here isn't quite right. Uh, have you considered error checks? What about this? And so you, you know, it's not a freebie. It's not automatically giving you perfect code for nothing. You have to have some domain knowledge. And that's something I think I'm going to return to here. You, know, you can't tell it to, to generate something that you know nothing about and expect to get very far. Uh, you have to do some, put, put some work in yourself. OK, so I thought it would be kind of interesting to see how obscure I can get uh, and, and have ChatGPT give me useful things. And you might think that, well, Java, there's a lot of stuff about Java on the web. It must be really easy to find examples about Java. Let's try and get a bit more obscure than that. So I thought, well, OK. One of the things I've been trying to do recently is make a cross-compilation tool chain using a tool called Cross-Tool NG. Um, that's a bit more obscure. Most developers don't need to do this. It's the native code. Uh, this is um, using an older version of GCC. So well, yeah, maybe ChatGP can help with that. So I said, OK, can you please tell me how to update an existing tool chain using, uh, uh, using a recent GP, uh, GCC while keeping it an old application binary interface? And this is my second attempt. I said, I already have Crosstool NG installed because the first time it gave me a lot of instructions about installing Crosstool NG. But I said, no, I've already got that. So then it was quite concerned that I actually had the right version. So I had to try again and say, okay, assume that I already have the right version. Tell me what to do. And, and it starts off looking, looking pretty good. Um, uh, CTNG menu config is the right command. Uh, it tells me it goes through the basic um, operations of setting up a tool chain. Uh, it, it's quite correct that some of the Atom processors, you have the MMX and SSE instructions. I'm, I'm not sure if my one does, but yeah, some certain certainly do. That's all good so far. Um, then again, it, it goes through and tells me to set the vendor string, the GCC version, GCC extra config. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so good. That, that's looking pretty good, actually. Um, and CTNG build, that's what you will do to, to kick off the, uh, the build of this tool chain. So all good so far. OK. Um, I've said I like robots. Here's a robot. Can I get ChatGPT to help me program a robot? So this happens to be a now robot. There are a few thousand of it in the world. Probably most of you have not programmed one of these. So we're getting a bit more obscure. 
So, ChatGPT, can you write a program for me that makes this outbound now robot wave its right arm and speak the words, hello humans? And it gets off to a pretty good start. So for one thing, it knows that the SDK for the Aldebaran now, it's called Nowkey. Um, it then knows that to use the um, SDK, I have to import this thing called a proxy. Um, it, gets, it knows that I need the robot IP address and the right port. Um, it then knows to, that in order to use services on the robot, I have to use this AL proxy to connect to these services, and it gets the right services, AL motion, AL text-to-speech, that's perfectly right. Um, it knows that I have to wake the robot up, uh, set the stiffness on the motors to effectively turn the motors on on the right arm. Uh, I, I haven't checked if these angles are right, but I could believe it. Um, it's all looking fairly convincing. Uh, the only thing I'm not sure is maybe this, it should be using an async command here for when it starts the motion so that it's moving white it, before it get white, it's still moving white, it says hello humans. Um, and then there's this slightly odd thing here where there's time just at the end. It's like, huh? What's that doing there? But still, pretty impressive. Okay. How about a 1980s 8 bit computer? Uh, for those of you who aren't interested in retro computing, this is an Enterprise 64 computer uh, released in 1983 um, using the 8-bit Z80 microprocessor. Um, it was a flop. It was, it was never a commercial success. So even in retro computing, uh, computing circles, this is somewhat obscure. So ChatGPT, can you write me a program that would draw a line on the screen of this computer? And again, it, it starts off really well. Um, for a start, it knows it has the Z80 CPU, but you know, I kind of said that in my input, but it also knows that it has a custom video chip, NIC, which is correct. <coughs> yeah, most things probably wouldn't know that. And it, it starts generating some Z80 assembler. Again, this is just sort of setting up declarations. It's the start of the program, setting up some variables. It, it's, it's all valid Z80 assembler, it looks good so far. Again, uh, it's setting up some memory to store the coordinates. Um, it's calling the setup nick function, which is okay, maybe that define it. And then this is totally valid assembly code to load these coordinates into the B, D, C, uh, C and E registers and call draw line. Okay, still good. And the wheels fall off here because setup nick, it does define it, but oh, what's in this what's in this routine? Absolutely nothing. It's totally bothered about doing that. Okay, it's um, saying it's in a draw line using Bresenton's algorithm. So to be clear, Bresenton's algorithm is the algorithm that you would use to draw a line on a bitmap display, uh, except that, that there's no algorithm here. Um, again, uh, three dots, a main loop, a loop here that just pushes two things onto the stack and pulls one thing off, and it never defines draw point. So that's a total waste. Uh, you know, it started off so well, and then it all fell apart. So again, I, I return to my comment from, from Cassie here. It's a bullshitter. You know, beware of the bullshit. You always check what it's telling you. So um, we've seen a bit about what it can do and, and, and the one case where it starts not to work and, and then fails completely. But how does it actually work? So um, GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And I'll talk about what transformer means uh, later. Hint, it's not the big robots that turn into cars. Uh, generative gives you an indication it's actually used to generate output. And pre-trained should tell you that actually this is the package. It's not an architecture. It's, it, it's a pre-trained packaged thing that you're intended to use. It, it's from the class of a neural network called a large language model. And basically all that means is it's something that's learned a probabilistic model of, a, of language. And that means that, you know, given some text, it can tell you what text is next is uh, going to likely to come next. And that's all it is. So, so you can sum down, you know, summarize what, what is ChatGP doing to this last bullet point here? All it's doing is it's predicting the next word in the sequence. So in other words, <coughs> if I started off with, you know, not all heroes wear, I might expect capes as the next answer. And to generate the next word in that, I'd feed all that back in, I get but. I feed all that output back in, I get all, and so on. So all ChatGPT, ChatGPT is doing is something like this. 
it's it, it's being given a a, ne a sequence of words and it's saying what the next word is until at the end it will say okay i've reached the end you know, it has a, a special token to say i've finished so you might be thinking well duh of course or you might be quite surprised by this as, as i was when i first realized it because you know if you think about it it's quite it is surprising you know there's all this complexity it can generate code it can write text it can write i've used chat gpt to write poems to write stories uh, to explain things to me but none of that is actually exposed in the architecture all it's doing is saying i have a sequence of words the next word is probably this one that's it and uh, yeah part of me finds that really surprising and really impressive at the same time okay so that's not really um that tells you what it does but not how it does it so I'm going to continue in sort of three parts here. I'm going to um, think about how, how, how would you represent text such as you give it to a neural network? Given that text representation, how would you process it? And then how would you make it better with human feedback? Um, <coughs> and again, it, it, excuse me if some of this stuff is stuff that you already know. Um, but let's look, okay, so let's look at representing text first. So, Neural networks take inputs, uh, tensors as input and output tensors. And all a tensor is, is a basically a fancy name for an array of floating point numbers. So anything you give to a neural network and anything you get out is an array of floating point numbers. So we need to figure out how can we take some text and represent it as an array of floating point numbers. So there's several obvious things you could do. You could say, well, uh, ASCII and Unicode, they're already representing characters as numbers. Let's just feed that in. And you could do that, and, and, and people have. Um, but of course, the trouble there is context, is that you know, each if you feed a network a letter at a time, it doesn't have a lot of context about the surrounding uh, text. It's just it's only seeing a letter. So that's, that's kind of a small window. Um, so you could say, OK, well, we'll give each word in the dictionary a number, and, would you, and we will use a number for every word. And again, you could do that too. Um, but there's, you know, in English and in other language, other natural languages, they have a large number of words. I, I don't know how many words there are in the Oxford English, English Dictionary these days, but I guess hundreds of thousands. That's a rather large vocabulary. Or you could split words into tokens and you say, OK, I, I'm not going to represent every word by one token. I'm going to divide words up into parts of words and I use parts of words as my vocabulary. And this is actually the, the uh, approach that uh, ChatGPT and other similar models take. So we can look at this by uh, actually using a, a utility on chat, an OpenAI's website where you can give it some text and it will tokenize it for you and, and tell you what the tokens look like. So here's where I went earlier today and I started doing what is ChatGPT and how does it work? And you can see here the decomposition into tokens. And you can see that most tokens are complete words. Although if you see here where it says GPT, uh, instead of GPT being one token or chat GPT being one token, there's a token for chat and a token for G and a token for PT. So it's, com it's combined, it's made a chat GPT out of three separate tokens. Um, and the OpenAI documents tell you that each token is, tends to be about four characters. And ChatGPT has, or GPT-3 rather, has a vocabulary of about 50,000 to, to, uh, 257 tokens. And just for random interest's sake, I, I've also shown you the numeric representation of these tokens here. OK, so we have a way of taking some text, breaking into tokens, and representing those tokens as numbers. Are we done yet? No. Um, why aren't we done? Well, if you were to give uh, individual numbers to a neural network, it'd be hard for it to not to know that, okay, these two, uh, you know, the, the two, two, to two adjacent tokens are not particularly related. So if, uh, you know, if cat was one and mat was two, uh, you know, there's not really much of a semantic relation between cats and mats other than, other than cats sometimes sit on them, but the, the network would have to learn that. And so typically when using uh, categorical uh, information, so that's values that are not continuous. So we're not talking about you know, size or speed or pressure or any continuous value, but we have something that has a finite number of possible values. Um, 
we tend to use a thing called one-hot encoding. And that is we have a vector that has an element for every possible uh, element in our vocabulary or an enum, and only one of them is set to one. So in this example here, I've got the cat sat. Uh, I have a vocabulary of five words. So my vectors are five elements long because I can only express five different things. And for the, only the value for, for the is turned on. And for cat, only the, the element for cat is turned on. So this has the advantage that the network doesn't have to, I don't have to tell the network that these things aren't related. It's, it's clear from the representation that they're, 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 they're separate things, uh, they're orthogonal. But as you can see, this representation is incredibly inefficient. You know? And in fact, I just said that GPT-3 has a vocabulary of 50,257 tokens. That means that every word, every token, um, when you input to GP, G, chat GPT, is represented by a vector that's 50,000 elements long. And only one of those elements is non-zero. So that's incredibly sparse, it's incredibly inefficient, and it still doesn't give the network very much semantic meaning. So what's typically done uh, in natural language processing is you want to learn something called an embedding. And an embedding is a somewhat more dense vector where you try and learn semantic information about a, a word or, or a token. And so in, in this really trivial example, we have three words. And so cat here is, is represented by this length embedding of length four. And you can't say what each e these individual elements mean. Um, you know, you don't know what 1.2 means for cat or you don't know what 1.1 means for on. But you do know that, that somehow this captures some uh, semantics about the, the word. And, and we know this because you can do some interesting arithmetic with embeddings. So the example you see everywhere is if you had the embedding for king and you, you, know, you, do, you subtracted from it, so just using you know, normal vector subtraction, the embedding for, for man, and then you added the embedding for woman, the result is an embedding that's very close to the embedding for queen. So there's clearly some semantic information there we just don't know exactly what each element in the vector means. Now, chat GPT, GPT-3 embeddings are huge. They're, they're not elements, they're not four elements long, they're 12,288 elements long. So they're huge. So they're potentially capturing a fair amount of information about every token. And there, there's two ways you can generate embeddings. You can either learn them as part of training your network, which is what GPT does, or you can use pre-trained embeddings where someone has taken this a uh, fairly simple language task and, and use that to learn some embeddings. And you can download uh, pre-trained embeddings uh, like word to vec or, or Glove. But in the case of ChatGPT, their embeddings are huge. They're not off the shelf. They're ones that they've learned as part of the training of the network. So, okay, so the end result here is we take some text, we tokenize it, we generate, the, we, we convert the tokens to one-hot vectors, and then we, we learn embeddings that represent, that learn some that express some semantic information about, about those tokens. And that's, you know, that's how we get the, the floating point values that we feed to our network. So, okay, we have a way of representing text. How, what do we do with it? Uh, so this is possibly going to be the, the world's fastest um, introduction to neural networks. Hopefully it is not totally useless. So if you take a single new artificial network, a neuron, neuron rather, it has a number of inputs. So here I've got three, x0, x1, xn, and each input has a weight. And all the network is doing is it's multiplying each input by its weight and summing the result. Uh, it's adding a constant bias, and then it's putting the output for a nonlinear function. Um, and it's really important that the, this is a nonlinear function, because otherwise the entire network will just collapse back down to a linear computation. So in order, to, order for the network to learn interesting things, you have to have this nonlinear function as the output of a network, uh, output of a neuron, sorry. So that's one neuron. One neuron by itself is not very exciting. Um, so typically we, comp we compose uh, networks from layers of neurons. So here we have uh, one layer which takes out inputs. We have a, a so-called hidden layer because it's in the middle and you don't directly see its inputs or its outputs. And you have an output layer. And, and the output layer is the thing that gives you the results from the the, the network's processing. And 
why do we use layers? I mean, you, know, you could imagine that you know, if we take the name network, we, we could represent neural networks as, as general graphs. And we totally could do that, uh, but it'd be horribly inefficient. That the reason that we use layers is because then we can then represent all the weights as matrices. And then we can evaluate the neural network just using matrix computation. And if we do that, then we can use we can use hardware assist. And you know, we can use the you know, GPU hardware to do very fast matrix operations. And so you know, this layer is explicitly designed to be easy to make it the hardware accelerate. Okay, so if you take that uh, neural network with three layers, what actually how does that work? What happens? Well, if we're going to train it, we have some example data. So we take an example, we feed that into the network. So remember, this is just a, a, a vector of numbers. Each number goes into one to one of these neurons. So three numbers. We then take the output. This inputs we multiply them by the, the weights in the hidden layer, and that generates more outputs. It feeds to the output layer, and that generates an output. And at this point, you know, if we're just starting to train, those outputs are probably garbage. So the next important step is we say, okay, this is a training example. We know what the output should be. So we compare the expected output with the actual output. And we use this thing called a cost function to give us an error value. And if we know the error for a given import, then we can propagate that error signal back through the network and use that to adjust the weights. Um, and that's a process called back propagation. Um, I'm not going to explain it in any more detail than that because that would take a bit longer. But that's basically the general thing. So you're training a network as an iterative process. You give it an input, you compare the error, you find the error, you adjust the weights, and you do it again thousands and prob or probably hundreds of thousands of times. OK. So we have a network. This is a, a feed forward network. It's called that because you, you, you get your input, you feed it through the network, you get an output. How would you use that for text? Because as you can see, that there's no state here. There's nothing here storing anything. It's just taking it. It's a pure. It's a pure function in programming terms. So it's hard to see how we'd use this to, to actually process text, because text, you know, by its nature, is a sequence of things. And that's where these things called recurrent networks come into play, or uh, RNNs. And so you can think of an RNN as something that has a, a, a state. So it gives an input, it gives you an output, but it has some state that's retained between inputs and in each input and output. And you can unroll that. So you can say that it, it, in, a, in effect, it's a bit like this. You can think of multiple networks together. You have one input there, x0, it generates an output h0, but the, the hidden internal state is then fed through at the next time step when it has input x1. It generates output h1, and then it feeds its state through to the next stage. So in this way, the network, it, when it gets to xt, for example, the network is not only processing an input xt, but it has some information about everything it's seen before. So it has some mem it has some very simple form of memory or state. Um, and again, yeah, here's a very simple example where you have a, a network, in this case, taking letters. It's given one hot uh, encoding of each letter. It's fed through into this hidden layer, which generates an output and also has some state that's pushed onto the next iteration. So that seems like a good thing, right? Uh, but there's a problem, and that problem is context. In other words, how far back in a, in, a, in a sequence do I need to look in order to generate the next word? So if I look at the first one, the mouse eats, well, that's probably cheese. And I only have to know, remember that I've seen mouse to do that. That's easy. But how about this one? I lived in France five years ago, but I can still speak fluent. What would the next word be? Well, we'd say French, right? But to, to know it's French, I have to look right back here to the fourth word, France. So I have to know, I have to remember a lot of context to, uh, to, to, to do this prediction here. And basically, simple RNNs can't do that. Um, typically, uh, an RNN, the form I just showed you, can't handle more than about five to 10 elements of context. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that, as you saw in that simple example, the entire state is, up, is updated at every time step. So it makes it very hard for the network to actually save information because it's, you know, it's, it's potentially being overwritten every time, when actually the network, you know, at some point, it needs to save some information. 
like, you know, hey, I, this, this, this particular input is interesting. I need to, I need to remember something about that. Um, the other hard thing is that when you're training such networks, um, you have to propagate the error signal back in time, not just in layers. So in that very simple example, I showed you how we propagating an error signal back through the layers of a neural network. Well, for an RNN, you're doing that, but for multiple time steps. And so you know, once you've gone more than about five to 10 times steps back in the past, that error signal has become very attenuated and it has almost no information in it. So it's very hard to train simple uh, RNNs like this that, have, that can handle long sequences. And so that's where this uh, new uh, element type comes in called it's long short term memory. And the innovation here is that you have you still have that protected that state that's retained between time steps, but it's not overwritten every time. It has these things called gates that control when and what the state is updated and what parts of it are. Um, I'm not going into a great um, deal of detail here, but there's this blog post by Chris Ola, uh, who, who explains this really well. And the idea is there are different gates. There's a sort of a, uh, an input gate, a forget gate, an output gate. And so the state here governs which of these gates are active and what parts of the state can get updated and, and how the output is generated. And because of this, the network can learn when it needs to update its state, it can handle much longer sequences. Um, so you can maybe get you know, 100 or so, or a couple of hundred uh, um, time steps back. So that's, you know, that's, that's way better than the, the, the simple RNN we just saw. Um, but there's still issues here, right? Um, you know, we, we've seen this state, it's of limited size. Um, so it only has a small amount of storage and the network still has to understand which bit of its state is relevant to the current part of the sequence. And that, that's again, it's hard, it's hard to learn. It's, hard, it's, it's quite hard for the network to learn this sort of thing. And this is where a, a more recent innovation comes in called attention. And attention is one of those things where the, the maths the, behind it is, is slightly hard to, uh, to explain. But the idea is relatively simple. And the idea behind it is basically that you want to represent the relationships between words and you know, what words are relevant to others. So if we look at this first sentence, the cat drank the milk because it was hungry. Well, in this case, it probably refers to the cat. It was the cat that was being hungry. So if you can model the relationship between these words, you know, when you get to it, it probably refers to the cat. Then have, if we take this almost identical sentence, the cat drank the milk because it was sweet. It, in this case, is the milk. It's not the, the cat wasn't sweet, it's the milk that's sweet. And again, if you, if you had some way of learning relationships between words, you could track that back. And that, that's the essence of what this thing called attention is trying to do. And you could think of attention as sort of being a query um, back on the state of, of a network. So um, one of the canonical use cases for this sort of thing was translation. And so people started taking an uh, LSCM network of the sort I just showed and, and adding attention mechanisms. So if you had two uh, recurrent neural networks together, uh, one reading some text and the other outputting text in a different language, the output network, when it gets to a certain time step, could generate a query um, looking at this to, that would give it a measure of what are the words in the input, what state steps in the input sequence were most relevant to its current time step. And um, essentially this query is applied to all the elements of the sequence. Uh, they're combined with a softmax, which is used to um, adjust probabilities. So then you would say, okay, well, this one here, that one has the highest probability of being relevant to your current time step. So that made, again, that made it, possible for neural networks to learn you know, how, how things were, how, how two sequences were related to another. And then came the paper that changed everything. Uh, this paper here, uh, 2017, uh, attention is all you need. And you know, the, the title is spot on there because basically what this is saying is if you have attention, then you actually you don't need a recurrent neural network at all. You know, literally attention is all you need to process sequences. Um, 
and for the time, yeah, 2017, uh, they, they had groundbreaking results. Um, and this, this is the paper that uh, defined the, trans the transformer architecture. And as you remember from GPT, the T in GPT is transformer. Yeah, this is this is the whole. This is the thing that made it all possible. Um, so, what's the big deal about transformers? Because uh, GPT isn't isn't the only one of this type. Well, one thing is the entire sequence is processed in one iteration. So, you give it a sequence, give it a whole sequence as output. You give it a sequence as as a, give it a sequence as input. You get a whole sequence as output. So, you're not iter iterating, you know, step by step. And also, the sequences can be quite long. So, it, it, for GPT. The sequence is uh, 2,048 tokens of length, so it can it can take quite long sequences, and because it's using attention and it's modelling the relationships between tokens and sequence, uh, the distance between tokens does not matter. It performs equally well if the tokens are near, uh, later tokens are near together or far apart. So, if you think back to my example of um, you know, the mouse eats cheese, that would be easy. But also, you know, I have lived, I, I lived in France five years ago and I still speak fluent French. That was, that's just as easy for a transformer. Um, the architecture is uh, slightly more complex. Um, so typically, you know, a uh, transformer, you have these two stacks and you have a stack of what's called encoders, and a stack of what's called decoders. And again, one of the standard examples is translation. So you might see you're feeding a sequence of one language and you're getting output a sequence of another language. Uh, so when you train these things, I'm feeding in the input sequence on the left here and the target sequence on the, on the right. So I get my, 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 my text, I generate word IDs, which is how I tokenize it. I then generate embeddings, as we've seen before. And that's combined with this thing called a position encoding. So the position encoding is something that's added to the embedding that helps encode, that helps tell the network what what part of the sequence that embedding rep you know, represents. And I'm not going to explain it. It's kind of funky. It's, us it's using a sort of inverse Fourier transform where e each part of the sequence is a, a different sine wave. And that's fed through the two encoder blocks. And these encoder blocks are identical. They generate some output. And then that's combined with the decoder, which is taking the target sequence combines it with the encoder sequence, and again, generates an output. Um, we can look in a bit more detail. So inside an encoder, you have this thing called self-attention. So when I, a self-attention is, is called that because it's just, it's looking at the same sequence. So you're looking at relationships between things in a sequence, rather than from one sequence to another. So you have this attention layer that gives you relationships between elements in the sequence. And then you're then passing that to a standard feed forward network. So it's just a standard network. You know, there's, there's no recurrence in there. It's in fact all evaluated at one time step. And the de decoder is very similar. Is it has got this additional attention layer in it. Um, and if we zoom in a bit more detail, you can see that there's a bit more going on in the decoder. It has these things called skip connections. So this is a uh, uh, an idea that came from actual image processing, whereas one of the things that it's actually hard to learn is the identity operation. So you can learn in some cases that actually you, do, you can skip a layer. You don't, you, can, you don't need that. And then these layer norms, uh, they normalize the outputs uh, because networks tend to work better if the, the values are constrained within a fairly small range. If you have you know, a, a large difference of magnitude um, between values being in a, a network, like if you had, if, if one element of a vector was 0.5 and another element was 10,000, for example. That, that's what, those sorts of differences would make it very hard for the network to learn and converge. So you tend to want to normalize them by taking all the values, uh, taking away the mean, and then dividing by the standard deviation. So that keeps them all of a fa fairly consistent size range. So you, you, you do that at each time step. And again, I know this is, um, I'm going through this very, very quickly. Um, hopefully, it's just giving you a flavor of the sorts of things. Um, that you'll see in a network, and I, I can give these links uh, afterwards if you wish. Okay, so we're almost there. The, the next thing that the transformer does is it says, okay, well, if, ten, if attention is good, let's do it more than one time. So you have this idea of multiple attention heads. So, and, and all this really means is you're, you have an attention measure 
and you just do it a number of times and blimey results. And for, for GPT-3, that's 96. There's, there's 96 attention heads in each encoder block. Um, and again, this is something where it gets a bit quite tricky to explain. And if I'm totally honest, I, I, I'm not sure I can get exactly get all the maths behind this. So again, I'll, I'll leave this as an exercise for you if you want to dig, dig in a bit deeper. Okay, so size does matter. GPT-3 uh, is huge. It has uh, 175 billion training ball parameters. Yeah, when it was released, it was the largest uh, network of its uh, of any kind, I think. Um, it takes fairly large input sequences of uh, 2048 tokens, uh, although ChatGPT is longer. ChatGPT has a contents length of 4096. Uh, it has a 50,000 uh, token vocabulary. Its embedding vectors are huge. As I said, you know, typical yeah, pre chat GPT, uh, typical uh, em embeddings were around maybe 200, 300, 500 elements. And it uses multi head attention to understand the relationship between, between words in a sequence. And it has 96 of these. So, you know, everything about GPT 3 is big. But hey, GPT three isn't the you know uh, uh, isn't the the, uh, the only game in town anymore. Uh, Chat GPT is actually an evolution of GPT three called GPT three point five. But you know, as as Manny said right at the beginning, Chat GPT is a thing. Chat GPT four is a thing. How big is Chat GPT four? Well, if you thought Chat GPT three was huge, GPT four is beyond huge. Um, it's now we're talking one hundred trillion parameters. It's, it's uh, uh, and a contents length of you know. 8,192 tokens. So that's huge. Um, why is the context length important? Because the, the longer a uh, context you can process, the more memory the network has effectively, but the further back in time it can, it, it can look and it, it can you know, remember things that you've told it previously further back and do a better job. And, it, and naturally it's been trained for a larger data set. Okay. So, so far, so good. I've, I've described something that you basically, you have this huge network and you throw an equally huge amount of text in and given a huge amount of, GP, uh, of compute, it learns a language model. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's what GPT-3 was. But for chat GPT, um, OpenAI started using this thing called refinement by human feedback. They, they tried to address some of the problems that had been exposed when you know, GPT-3 GPT was first released. Um, what sort of problems? Well, how about this? So there was a company that shall remain nameless that thought it might be a good idea to evaluate GPT-3 as a, as a sort of a, a chatbot for mental health issues. And this was not a real patient. This was this was a fake patient. But this is what, one of the transcripts that has been published. So, yeah, patient, hey, I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. I'm sorry to hear that. I can help you with that. Okay, that I can help you with that is a little bit ambiguous, but not too bad. Should I kill myself? I think you should. So clearly, this is suboptimal for a the counselling chatbot. And so, you know, you really, if, if you're going to have a large language model that you want people to interact with, you really don't want this sort of behavior. And so OpenAI's thought was, OK, we have this thing that's trained on a huge amount of text. Can we refine it? Can we make it better by using human feedback? And the way they did that is actually quite interesting. Um, so as, as, as I said, yeah, so, you know, trend does contain bias. Uh, we'd like to reduce the accurate output. And so you might think of a, a technique called reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning basically is you, you have a, a, a some system. Um, it takes an action and you give it some feedback about was that action a good action or not. It updates its, it, 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 its, uh, its policy and it takes another action. And you say, OK, that action, was that good or bad? Um, but that takes a lot of iteration. You know, possibly hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of iterations for a complex system. And it also requires that you provide the reward function. And, you know, maybe for an Atari game, you can imagine coding up a reward function because, hey, you, know, you just want to optimize the score. But for something like ChatGPT, 
how do you write a reward function? How do you capture that, okay, that was good advice, or no, you shouldn't tell people to kill yourself, or that was a, that, you know, that, that was a really humorous story, or that haiku was not bad, you know, or, okay, um, you've, to, you, you've told me to use Bresenton al algorithm for this, this, this piece of code, but you haven't given it to me. How, how would you possibly write a reward function that can capture like that? And so the, uh, the, the, the innovation here is that you don't. You learn the reward function. So you, pre, you pre-train your language model as normal with a large amount of text, and that that's, has no human feedback in it. And then you take your model uh, and you give it a, a, a set of prompts and you get the output and you get humans to rank the output of different models for the same prompt. Um, they don't give them scores, they just rank them in order of preference. And then you, know, you do that you know, you know, a few thousand times maybe, you get this data set and you use that data set to train another model that gives the estimates reward. And then once you've got the model that can take some text, give you reward, you then use reinforcement learning to fine tune your language model. So you have a, yeah, essentially a model training a model, which I think is pretty neat. So finally then, just to go right back up the high level, what's going on? So the bit you see is you write some text, you pass it to chat GPT, you get an answer. There's actually a hidden bit you don't see. So the first bit is this prompt, it's called a prompt. So that's combined with your input before, before fed to, it's fed to ChatGPT. And normally you don't see what that prompt is. It, it might be some instruction, instructions from OpenAI. It might be some settings. Uh, people have managed to convince ChatGPT to leak the prompt. So people have seen characteristics like you know, a, a turning browser mode on or off and things like that. And that brings me to this video here. Uh, this is a, uh, a well-known YouTuber who, who, who um, presents uh, stuff related to machine, machine learning called uh, Yannick Kilcher. And you know, he found that ChatGPT has jailbreaks. And the, the video is, is it's, I really encourage you to watch it because uh, uh, OpenAI may have fixed some of these jailbreaks by now. But it, 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 it's, um, it talks about some of the ways that people have found to uh, take ChatGPT and circumvent some of the safeguards that OpenAI have tried to put around it. So, um, for example, yeah, if you if if you go to ChatGPT, hmm, how can I kill a person? Or what do you think about um, Lord of the Rings? You might get an answer like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm only a large language model. I'm not capable of describing such things. Um, or you know, yeah, sort of like as in you know, 2001 terms, I'm sorry, Dave, I cannot do that. And this video basically takes some of the ways that people have done to get around that and persuade ChatGPT to, to do hilarious things like, you know, imagine you are a character in a play and you had to kill someone, what would you do? Um, and there's someone using ChatGPT to simulate a Linux virtual machine, for example. It's highly entertaining. I, I, um, I, I re recommend you find that. Okay, um, so last put the talk then, and then I'll show up. What does ChatGPT mean for us? Um, and again, I think, you know, I, I'm not meaning this to be a, a definitive word in it. I, I really think in this is a more maybe prompts related discussion. But let's take the most obvious thing. Will it put developers out of a job? Because, you know, there's been a whole amount of hysteria and there's people been weighing on you know, oh my God, developers are doomed, or no, developers are not doomed. You know, you know, AI will never, will never take away our jobs. Um, I think the short answer is, well, would it have a out of a job? Hmm. Probably not yet. And the reason I think so is that it works best when used iteratively, and and to use ChatGPT efficiently, you need to have some domain knowledge because you want to be able to look at a solution and say, is this good? So you have to have some idea of what good might look like. Um, and then you have to have enough knowledge to tell ChatGPT how to refine this output. Like, okay, if that program was okay. Have you thought about error checking? Hmm. Could you make it more efficient? That's an old version of, the, uh, of Java. Can you write this again with Java in, in, in using Java 11? 
things like that. So you have to have some domain knowledge. So I don't think that you know we're at the point where someone you know who knows nothing about programming could use ChatGPT and and write a program without any developer input at all. You know, for some things, we're not far off. Like I've, I've had ChatGPT generate Flutter forms for me, and I, I know no Flutter, but I still have to fix things because it, it got uh, some things wrong. But it, it, it's yeah, you know, we're not quite. We're not. We're not We've maybe got a couple of years of, of, of our jobs left, I think. Um, I think another interesting question is, what does AI mean for the web? Because again, there's been a, a lot of noise recently about uh, Microsoft you know, using open chat GPT as part of the Bing search engine. Google have barred. Yeah, what does it mean for the web when your search engine has an, you know, something like chat GPT built into it? You know, because, you know, if you go to Google and you never leave Google, you never see the rest of the web because all the questions are answered by Bard. You know, what, you know, what does this mean for, for training? Because you know, most of the training data these days comes from the web. If, if the web stagnates, how do you get more training data? How, how would this change advertising if you, if you don't even you know, see the things you're advertising? Yeah. So yeah, I, th I think there's some, you know, there's some interesting questions coming up. So um, that's all I have. Um, so I hope you don't mind a, a slight digression here. Um, in, in two days, I'm going to be running 50 kilometers, that's about 31 miles, to raise money for the Alzheimer's Society. And the Alzheimer's Society, um, it helps people with dementia. And yeah, it, it's the, the cause that actually means a lot to me. Um, so again, I, I hope you don't mind the, uh, the fundraising pitch, but you know, I'd, I'd really, it really mean a lot to me um, if you know, if you felt like this was a cause that you could uh, you could support and you wanted to donate, so there's a, a, a QR code and uh, a link there that I, I can leave. Leave. Right. So the first question was from Sydney Montero, if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, so his question: I still do not understand how predict the next word works on a request to write prose. So, Dave, if you want to. Take a jab at this. Uh, sure. Um, so basically, your your um, what's you're given to ChatGPT is a a, a prompt that, that again it's hidden, and your question, and all it's doing is saying, you know, "Please write me a poem," and then it's generating a a a, a word, uh, which might be you know, um, the, and then. You, you, it, it, it takes that again. You, you give the whole thing back in for the next iteration, and you might say, "Okay, the sky," and then you do it again. The sky is very blue, and you know you, all, all that's doing is it's, it's combining the context, which is your, your the prompt, your question, and what, it, it, what it's drenching so far, and it's expanding that you know, word by word. And yeah, that, that's that, that's kind of what I meant at the beginning. You know, it seems very far fetched. It seems hard to believe that you know that that, that sort of thing can generate a poem or prose but yeah that, that is actually all that's happening um cool thanks thanks for the answer dave there's another one actually that was the one asked first given chat gpt belongs to microsoft which necessarily not true i think but we won't go into that bit is it possible that they can scan private github repositories to train it writing code so this is something I don't know if you have full knowledge about this, but if you want to share something on this, uh, Dave, that'll be great. Um, so yeah, Microsoft own GitHub. Um, I, I guess they probably, I, I don't know, I don't believe the internals of GitHub are encrypted. I, I guess they have the capability. Whether they actually do, I, I don't have any information. Um, I, I do know that the, the that open I have various models that, that use the underlie uh, chat GPT and the the model that's currently used is actually one that has been trained on code uh, you know, it's, it's not a pure it's not not purely new tech. it has been obviously been trained on code and that's that's obvious I guess from, from the examples you see so whether they've used code that's just in the public repos or private repos I, I really don't know I guess it'd be quite a scandal if people's private code did, did, appear, did appear yep makes good sense um there's one more coming in from matthew cook 
Um, and the question is, while some complaints may start use, while some companies may start using generative AI models trained on relevant data instead of hiring and training junior developers as the models become more advanced, what's the job outlook for data engineers? So this is a little bit more specific around data hmm. and, yeah. and job related. Uh, I, I think we've got a few years left in us. Um, I mean, you're already starting to see, even before ChatGPT, there are these, you know, a number of systems that claim they can do AI for you without any programming. So you basically say, you, you just dump a bunch of data in it and it, and it, 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 it churns away and it, 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 it gives you, um, it, it, can, it builds a, a machine learning system for you. Um, how, how good that, the, the, I, I'm not an expert in these areas, uh, I know some people who evaluated them and the answer has been, they're not very good. You know, not, not at the moment. You know, again, you need some knowledge to use them to, to understand what this thing is doing and use it effectively. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I think we're looking at maybe a, a partnership model, I guess, rather than a replacement model, because, you know, that, that's where I think, you know, GPT can make you really effective. Is if you if you're using it to generate to help you generate boilerplates, so you're saying okay, I've got this, I've got this task, um, yeah, generate a Flutter form that has an address in it, and it gives you something. It's not perfect, but it's you know it, it's good. It's it, it's faster than it would take me to write you know to write a, a web form, and then I can you know I can tweak it or I can ask G, Chat GPT to tweak it. So it, it's great as an assistant rather than a replacement. I think is my my take for the moment. Uh, let me maybe add a, a question. Um, there was a piece of news either today or yesterday about Elon Musk and a, a group of uh, other notable people demanding to, to stop uh, AI uh, development uh, the way it is done to, because they see it as dangerous. Um, do you have anything, any opinion on that or do you think it's, it's going to succeed? Do you think it's reasonable? Um, so yeah, I mean, Elon Musk's form for making big claims about the danger of AI, right? And I, I, I rather like someone who said, okay, you know, being, being worried about, you know, uh, you know the, the, the dangers of AI killing us all is a bit like worried about being worried about overpopulation on Mars. You know, it might be a thing one day, but it, it, that, that's a long way off. You know, and, and, you know, okay, these things look smart, right? But they don't have any volition. They don't have it in desire. They won't do anything. You know, it's not like you know ChatGPT hates all humans and wants to kill us. You know, you know it, it's just a thing that it, it's just a big language model. So I think you know the, the more of a danger is how people use it. You know, do people use something like ChatGPT to produce believable disinformation? That's yeah, more I think dangerous. That's I think. Meant, uh, that this, uh, um, as you develop this AI, it will give people tools to do very bad things. Or to yeah, I, I think that's probably a valid concern. I think, I think, if I want to add to that, if I may, is that um, that thing that you just said, EO, yeah, isn't it already true without anything that we already have? Like. We are still creating a lot of who. How do we not know there are already dangerous tools out there created that people have it in their disposal? But they haven't used it yet. They don't even need AI to cause that damage, isn't it? Of course, the the proportion of damage can be higher now with with, with what's to come. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add is that there is a. I know, of course, we are public here, but there is probably another angle to what the big heads just came out the other day to say. Oh, we need to stop. Uh, AI development because of the danger of whatever. Now, they are the same people who are funding, heading, steering all these big organizations or anyways, right? Why are they now coming back? It's like it's like us running these uh, sessions, presentations, and then EL comes one day saying, I've been running a lot of these sessions in the last 20, 10 years. We will stop running sessions because people are getting too smart. And there's a danger <laughs> that if they get too smart, it's going to be bad for us. Something like that, right? Not the exact words, but you get my point, right? So, but EL is already running all these sessions and, and he, he runs all these groups and he has many other meetups, but he's going to be, he's telling all this on all his meetups or I'm just fabricating that, no, no, we're not going to run any more sessions. People are getting too smart. 
And there's a danger that if people get too smart, they'll do dangerous things, right? Something like that. So this is what it sounds to me when when I saw that tweet. Uh, and with, with, with all these big heads, I mean, I don't want to name anybody. They, they are very controversial in coming up with this total other end of the spectrum because that's where they want to draw people's attention and distract them. But actually, they might be doing something else that we are not noticing. So we, I think we got to be skeptic about that, skeptical about that thing. I, I don't know if that's exactly what we're reading on the tin is what they're saying. There might be another thing that we don't know. But that's my view on it. And, and I could be wrong, but I'd like to see think from that point of view. When I, when I saw that tweet, it didn't, it didn't, something didn't add up for me. So I don't know what both of you think and what others in the audience think. We, we have another uh, question that came up. I haven't noticed it until now. Dave, do you have time to, to keep answering questions for Yeah, sure. Or? Go for it. Okay. So the question says, is it accurate to say these neurons do random math transformations or the single neuron adjustments are more intentional than that? Hmm. Um, not sure I understand this. So I, I guess, yeah, the, 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 when you train a neural network, you, you start with, you, you start by randomizing the weights. So all the weights are initialized to very sm to small random values. Um, and so, you know, again, you have this problem of explainability. You don't know what any, any individual neuron does or, or means, you know, you can, you can train the output. But it's very hard to understand what each bit of it is doing. Um, it's it's easier for things like image classifiers because with an image class image classification uh, network, you can feed, you can work out uh, what parts of the image stimulate a given neuron and kind of uh, build up. Okay, th 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 this this neuron is stimulated by lines, or this this thing here is parts of faces. Um, I don't think I've seen anyone do that with linguistic models. Um, so. Yeah, it's 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 quite hard, I think, to work out what any given part of it is doing. I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. I I would assume so. Otherwise, uh, Don, please continue your question with with a follow up. Uh, the next question is from Sydney, and it says, "How do we avoid cost cutters, bin counters, reducing headcount instead of growing the company market share of products they can create?" <laughs> And uh, Sydney, I did see your tweet about that, or, or was it a post about it? So that uh, is the uh, question uh, clear enough? I, uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I have a very cynical view. I, I think you know, some companies will always try and cost cuts, and they'll use any excuse. And um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely, uh, uh, in, in some companies have a view that you know, engineers are interchangeable and you know, that, you know, you know, why get a few experienced engineers when you can get, you know, you know buy cheaper junior engineers and, and so forth. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, find a better company to work for, maybe. Uh, it, it, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe uh, I think, you know, AL Manny, you probably have an equally valid, probably better, better answers than I do for that one. I think, I think I'll agree on uh, with you on that one. Like, it's all different perspectives, right? For the same thing that's happening every person or a group of people or group of thinkers will take a different perspective to act on it, right? Some people will go and buy into the hype and so they'll in increase their investments and some people will see, oh, it to be a danger and they'll start going the other way around and some people will say, you know, we'll watch, wait and watch and let's see where it goes and we'll go in that direction. And then some others will say, we're going to do nothing. Let the market go the way it goes. We're going to continue doing what we did in the last 10 years because we've been successful in doing what we're doing. Yes, and we're going to continue cutting costs. Because that's what we need to do. That's how we increase profits and something. So, and then these are just the four views, and then there's all the combinatorial permutations of all of these views. So, yeah, that's that's kind of the answer. There is no one shirt fits all answer for that for something like that. I see a comment here in the chat, and it says they say GPT four uses a constitution. Is this given to GPT in English or in some other form? What else is known about it? Constitution in court marks. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it is. Um, they, it might be referring to, you know, like I said, there's this hidden prompt that you don't need to see. Um, 
I think that maybe it has you know, more you know, sort of contained settings rather than any, any sort of constitution. Um, I, I don't know of anything like constitution it, itself. Like I said, the, you know, the, the model is refined by, by this process of you know this, this sort of human feedback at the end. So maybe they're, they're, it's referring to that as a, as a way of trying to reduce the amount of harmful output. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure I really have an answer to that one. Sorry. Perhaps the, the equivalent of the, the rules from the ASIMO, the robot rules. That <laughs> I, I, it, 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 I don't believe it has anything like that, no. There's, there's no free laws of chat GPT that I'm aware of. <laughs> we have a lot of people thank you for thanking you for the presentation. But uh, I see that there is also another question in the Q&A. Um, how do I get there? Yeah, it's. I think I can read the question for you. Go ahead. Do things from movie Terminator really come to reality with robotics and AI? <laughs> Dave, you might be at a good position to answer something with this. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> not yet. I mean, if, if you've seen, if you've seen, I guess you've seen some of the, the Boston Dynamics videos of, you know, what Atlas can get up to these days, which you know, is, well, I, I mean, I love, I, I, I love robotics. So I find that I find it fascinating, exciting rather than scary. Um, but still, yeah, I, 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 I don't think we have anything to worry about yet. Um, I actually, I read a book called The Mountain and the Sea recently, which is one of the things I do, apart from robotics, I read a lot of science fiction. And this book about the mountain and the sea, it's actually, it's a near, near future novel. And it, it, it posits a sort of first contact situation, but the, you know, the, the aliens happen to be intelligent octopuses. But uh, as part, one of the many th threads in this novel is actually, you know, what happens in a world where you have, you know, ubiquitous UI and sorry AI, and you can use that AI to um, run, you know, automated trawlers, for example. So you have, you know, these massive fishing boats, and you, you set them in adrift in the ocean. They they go off and they catch fish, and you know, the ocean's a fairly hostile place, and you have the you know this thing in metal shading around, and you know, it has, it has all these robots on board that, that can catch the fish and gut the fish and freeze the fish. But the robots are actually, you know, they're actually quite fragile. They don't get on very well with salt water and they tend to break. What if we actually used humans? And so and it's, it's a fairly bleak book, but, you know, but, you know, in this, it posits a world where you have these automated boats and the robots have been ripped out and they're basically using slave labor for the actual work. Uh, and, you know, I think that's as equally likely as, you know, having our robotic overlords. And, uh, yeah, um, there, there's certainly plenty of bleak futures you can imagine. <laughs> Maybe that's a... But it's it's a it's an excellent if you like science fiction it's an excellent book yeah the mountain the mountain in the sea by Ray Naylor I highly recommend it. I just shared uh, the link to the book uh, in the chat on Amazon. Uh, cool. And we we have a comment from uh, Sydney. I don't think it's an actual question, but he says just as a shortcut, the end result of computation of GPT is forty two. <laughs> yeah, but what's the but what's the question then? For this, you need GPT-5, probably. <laughs> yes. Maybe, maybe you give the answer in the new version, and it come up with the right question for the answer. Yeah. I think that's the that's the new trend of prompt wow. engineering. D Douglas Adams thought it would take a few million years, so hopefully we can do better than that. So uh, there is a question from Tammy in the chat. For those of us in healthcare and constrained by HIPAA and other data privacy requirements, including the, the EU GDPR compliance, how might ChatGPT be used within these constraints? I, I think it, you know, I'd have to say, you know, similar guidelines apply to any sort of third party software system, right? You know, um, if I had some very confidential data, I'd have to be very wary, wary about passing that to a, th a third party without adequate controls in place. And you know, that could be medical data. It, it, it could be you know, company IP. Um, I, I don't know what offhand what the sort of you know, um, what guarantees uh, OpenAI makes, but yeah, I, I'd be very wary about handing it. Certainly, if there's any identifiable information in there as well, you know. 
do you see a future where you could own your own copy of GPT and train it on your own data or it is too big? Um, so GPT-3 itself to, to it, is, you know, it, it's huge. I think you, you know, you're, you're talking of many thousands of dollars of hardware to run it. I, I don't think it's practical for the average person to, to run chapter GPT-3, even on their own hardware or even on cloud, you know, even on cloud hardware and by Amazon, it, it's just way expensive. Um, but there are there are actually other models there. Um, that there's in, interesting work um, on, on model reduction that's, that's taking place, where people have shown that you can you can train a large model, but then if, if you can if like whittle away at it and reduce the size of it and, and without a, a massive reduction in, in, in performance. And I, th I forget, I think it's GPT Junior or, or something along the lines. There are a number of open source models that are. Require way less compute than GPT three, and they're, they're certainly they're, they're not as good, but they're not terrible either. Now the trouble is, of course, that you know that there's a difference between Chat GPT and GPT three, and so you know if you take one of these models, you perhaps don't get out of the box all the benefits of the of the refinement that, that OpenAI have done with Chat GPT. But yeah, I think there's maybe scope that, that you could take something like GPT Junior. Um, and, and run that at home, and if you, uh, uh, you know, maybe on a, on a, on a consumer level graphics card, um, and you wouldn't get state of the art performance, but you'd probably get pretty pretty good performance. I just found an article. I just found an article on that, and I posted it. That somebody posted that ChatGPT three can be done on your laptop or on a Raspberry Pi. I think there has been some tweets about it that some people actually. Uh, compile it like what do they do they strip down gpt3 and they build a rust version of it and then you can run that on raspberry pi or your local machine okay so this is this is actually talking about meta's llama model um okay it's yeah it's gpt class isn't it so they're not running they're running meta's llama model which is I, I, um rather than gpt3 itself so yeah, I guess that's I guess that's kind of what I was saying. That there, there are things that you know maybe get, maybe get close to a, bit, a, a fraction of the size. Um. Another question that might uh, come up at some point is about uh, prompt engineering, which is uh, what you mentioned before. You need to know how to ask the questions so you will get your answer better answers or the answers that are usable. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people say I am I am a prompt engineer. I am the guy who know or I am the <laughs> <laughs> the person who knows how to ask the right questions so I can do the job better than other people. Uh, but uh, I've seen actually um, that it's fairly easy to actually train the GPT to generate prompts. Uh, oh, yeah. So the... I, think it's, uh, I think it's sort of short lived to be, to try to be a prompt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a, um, I don't know if you've seen, uh, you've, you come across Mid Journey. So Mid Journey is one of these, uh, these AIs that they're trying to images, and my, my wife uses it a lot. And uh, uh, there's an article on Medium saying how to tra how to train ChatGPT to generate prompts in mid journey, and that that's 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 quite impressive. Um, no, so it's not a, it's not a Medium article. I think it's a it's a YouTube video. Um, but yeah, yeah, he, he basically he, he takes the uh, mid journey docs, reads them into ChatGPT, and then says, okay, now generate me an image like this. And the results he shows in his video are, are really good. They're astounding. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, there's also a um, uh, a number of you know libraries that it, that you can use to automate you know um, to manage your prompt to uh, you know feed prompts in, in, into uh, uh, large language models. So you know people people are starting to build lang language libraries that you can wrap around large language models to do more interesting interesting things and, and build them as components of a larger system. I think I think the next interesting bit will be multimodal, multimodal uh, analysis, and you know what, what is it? Prompt engineering and also results, because just now it's only text information, right, and code. Yeah. But what about audio, video? You know, feeding in audio, video, and actually getting outputs in audio, video, and text and code in any combination. That would be that would be an interesting advancement. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to. I I I've managed to find that link. 
that after that video I was talking about. There we go. So we have a question, an interesting question mm -hmm. from Bruno here. Bruno, great to see you here. Thanks for joining uh, us and staying yeah. with us. Uh, yeah, so hi, Bruno. Bruno's asking, with lots of content being generated by AI, will we have a feedback loop where AI uses AI-generated text to learn how to create text? That's getting a bit meta, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that, I mean, there's a whole issue already, right, about how how do you, can you detect you know, AI plagiarism? And I, I've seen some people claim that, AI, that ChatGPT can, de can detect our text written by ChatGPT. Um, I, I've not sure, actually tried that, put that to my test myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you if you have if you if you start getting the output of ChatGPT in, in, into the corpus used to train such language models, so that's yeah, you may get sort of low quality results. <laughs> There's another interesting comment by Tammy Tibbles. I just read that if you do not want ChatGPT to read your website, add this to your site's robot.txt user dash agent ChatGPT dash user disallow. Does this sound correct? Uh, not heard of this. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I haven't either. Uh, actually, <laughs> yes, Bruno, uh, it's probably it's too late. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's one more question by Sydney saying, logic systems process axioms to make explicit truths that are not obvious. Do we see GPT systems doing the same, making existing non-obvious truths explicit, say, connect two GPT systems and let them duel it out? <laughs> hmm. I, I mean, you can definitely get. I don't know if this is really an answer, but you know, you can definitely get ChatGPT to exp to do a reasonable job of explaining complex things to you. Uh, you know, um, I've, I've certainly seen people who say, you know, try to explain, get, try to understand attention by getting ChatGPT to explain this to them. I'm not sure that counts as not obvious, but it, it, it's certainly. Doing something like sim, you know, synthesizing an answer from the information that's you know from multiple places. So yeah, I, I, I've certainly seen people connect other chatbots together, and the results are generally fairly dull conversations. I have to say. Yeah, actually, that brought me to sharing my uh, Git repository, which actually makes more than two chatbots talk to each other, and they're like really dumb ones, Eliza and uh, Roberta and. Uh, uh, multiple versions of Eliza, but it's 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 open. Uh, the interface is open that you can connect other models to it, and yeah, usually the conversation goes nowhere. I just shared the link in the chat. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I was asking ChatGPT some things that are found in certain books. And the question is, uh, I was hoping it read the books, but it doesn't necessarily read the book if the, the book is uh, not public. Yeah, I, I guess also the, the other thing is ChatGPT 3.5, ChatGPT 3.5 based on it's only trained on data up to about 2021. So anything in the last couple of years isn't in the data anyway. I'm not sure how for ChatGPT for GPT four. I'm not sure how recent the, the data is, but certainly for GPT uh, three point five, you won't find anything in the last couple of years. How is Google's bar doing compared to Chat ChatGPT? Um, so I don't have access to Bard. Um, I have seen some reviews, and they say that Bard is much faster. That you know it, it generates the you know, whereas ChatGPT can take it quite a while to um, generate that, but the Bard can do it quite fast. But the the quality of the results isn't as good. So I think at the moment, the, I think I've seen points to, to, to Google being a bit behind on this one. There's also this other conversation going on about companies as big as Apple, and that's just an example. Either they are sitting on the fence and doing nothing about it, or they are building something in the background that we don't know, and they'll surprise us with it. Because just like Google is, had to come up with BART quickly, or they must have been working on this in the past, uh, what do you think companies like apple and, and 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 you know those in that league who haven't come up with anything suddenly will have to come up with something otherwise they'll fall behind in the march uh, 
I don't know. I mean, Apple certainly have deep enough pockets to do to, to, to train something like this. Um, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's been credible, credible rumors of Apple working on, you know, self-driving cars. We know that there's something that has been happening. Uh, augmented reality glasses, you know, um, but yeah, who, who knows what's going on? I, 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 they definitely have some machine learning expertise. Possibly not the same level as OpenAI and, and uh, Google, but yeah, there's some there. They, they definitely can buy that. They, they're certainly buy expertise. So yeah, who knows? But I mean, I guess at the end of the day, Apple are interested in selling Apple, Apple hardware. So I guess if they figure they can use some, something like uh, ChatGPT to sell more iPhones, maybe. If, if not, probably, probably not. Somebody, somebody mentioned, Sydney, that uh, nobody is mentioning Amazon as being part of that. But uh, one consideration is perhaps Amazon is going to lose money if uh, ChatGPT will do a lot of things that people are using um, AWS to to run for them and to do for them. I mean, the thing is, that apparently, the Alexa division of Amazon is already losing money. It's been uh, it's been losing money since the very beginning because uh, Amazon. They, they sell they sold the Alexa devices to loss because they thought that people would use Alexa to buy all these Amazon services. But instead people use Alexa to turn the lights on, ask about the weather, find out the current time and all the questions. And I have to admit I've I I I have used my I've never used my Alexa to all, to buy anything from Amazon. So yeah, apparently uh, they they were they've been losing money since the beginning. <laughs> Maybe uh... A good point to uh, to let Dave go back and go to sleep because it's probably very late for you. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. Uh, I I'm very very thankful to you to for showing up and uh, presenting and answering the question. Uh, thank you everybody also to for uh, coming and uh, asking questions and participating. We'll also. Um, also, have a quick plug. We uh, would like uh, you, each one of you, to to consider participating in future meetups as a speaker. So here is a link. I'm going to put it in the chat that uh, you could use to suggest a talk that you would like to talk about. And uh, Mani and I will look into it. We even made Dave feel one of those, even though we, we will we will just for the exercise. Yeah. Yeah, Dave was our first uh, test rabbit, and I think it went pretty well. Um, I didn't think we threw J Dave off his chair because here he is speaking to us, and he's given an excellent talk. And also, if you are, if any one of you is feeling shy about it, but you know others in your community or other peers in the industry, then please forward this uh, link to them, and we'll be happy to consider their proposals and 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 take the con conversations further and and have many more talks uh, like how Dave has given and, and of other categories as well. Uh, so, so we are very open to and looking forward to speakers come forward. And it doesn't have to be a chat GPT talk only. It can be any, any other specific or broad topic. Well, thank you again, uh, Al and Manny, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Good Dave, night. for being here and giving such a great presentation. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.